For over 90 years, World Learning has offered an array of TESOL programming, including intensive and customized training courses, leadership building, professional development for teachers, and educational system strengthening. We believe that when teachers are better educated and better equipped, they are better positioned to motivate and empower their students in their language learning. World Learning is excited to offer this webinar series as an additional resource. So we hope that this webinar will give you a lot to think about, but we ask that you avoid asking questions until the end of the webinar. There will be a dedicated Q&A session and Lois will invite you to type your questions in the WebEx chat. So when it's time, we encourage you to share. The chat looks like a speech bubble and it should be in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. Uh, it is available throughout the webinar if you have to ask for help with WebEx, uh, but please, as I said, wait until the end for any questions. Due to the large size of this group, we ask that you keep your videos off throughout the webinar. Microphones, as you've noticed, uh, will be muted for participants, except during breakout sessions and for selected questions during the Q&A session. So uh, one more time, I'm just going to ask everyone to please turn your videos off for the webinar. Um, okay, so among other activities, the webinar will include a PowerPoint presentation. For anyone joining on your phone, please tap the slideshow if you would like to make it full screen. Also, Web uh, WebEx offers closed captions for all devices, which you can turn on using the button in the lower left of your screen. It looks like a small speech bubble with quotation marks inside. So if you're having a little bit of difficulty understanding what I'm saying, that may be helpful. Lastly, as part of this webinar series, we are excited to introduce a digital badge system for participants. This badge is a system of accomplishment for those of you here who have committed to strengthening your language education proficiency by participating in this webinar. It can be downloaded, printed on a certificate with your name or shared online. We included information about the badges in a reminder email but as uh, an additional reminder, you will need to submit a request through a short Google form to receive the badge. The link to the Google form has been posted in the WebEx chat. You should be able to see it now. It was posted by Gina. Uh, it will be posted again at the end of the webinar. And we do ask that you wait until the end uh, to start the survey, just so you can have the full experience of the webinar first. You will have until November 28th to submit the Google survey in order to receive your badge. Within one week, we will send an email with a PDF of the presentation slides, uh, which will also include links to resources used in the presentation. We'll include some more information about the digital badges, some answers to some of the questions in the WebEx chat that were not addressed during the Q&A session, and a link to our uh, World Learning TESOL YouTube page, where you will find an, un, uh, an edited recording of this webinar. So please keep an eye out for that email. With all that being said, I am pleased to introduce our speaker today, World Learning's Education Advisor in Curriculum and Training, Lois Scott Conley. Lois leads the design and delivery of World Learning's teacher development programs across the globe on a range of topics, including English language teaching, intercultural communication, and classroom psychosocial support. She has 40 years of experience as an educator and designs and implements English language, teacher development, and training of trainers curricula to improve teacher knowledge and pedagogical practices, especially in relation to learner-centered methodologies and reflective practice. Lois, I welcome you to take the virtual floor. Great. I'll just share once again that we're going to start by, I'm not going to repeat everything. We'll start by um, defining communicative activities and their benefits. Then we're going to look at information gap activities, uh, followed by a breakout room task, and then opinion and reasoning gap activities, which are part of communicative activities. And then another breakout, class, breakout room task, followed by Q&A. So once again, let's look at these two activities with pair work. Um, I was saying a little bit about them, so I'll repeat some of that. Um, 
so in activity number one, the instructions are to write the conversations and practice with a partner. And after using these prompts to write grammatically correct sentences, students read the dialogue in pairs. So both of these activities are pair work and we're trying to decide which one is more communicative and why. In activity number two, the students have three similar prompts in the table asking questions about times and daily schedules. The instructions say to write two more questions and then ask three classmates the questions and write down their answers. They should also ask their classmates a follow-up question, whatever they choose. Both activities involve students talking to students. So which one is more communicative? And as I said before, I'm sure that many of you selected number two, and let's look at why. In um, both, in number one, both students know the information that they're speaking about, right? And in number two, the person asking the question doesn't know what the answer will be. And the person who's answering the questions, they don't know most of the questions that will be asked. They do know the first three. So there is a reason for them to listen to each other. Plus, and this is important, uh, they have a purpose, well, all of it's important. They have a purpose for asking the questions to find out who is most like them. This is uh, a communicative activity that's designed to practice specific grammar that you may find in your textbook. Uh, we know that many English language textbooks are organized around a grammatical syllabus, and we're going to focus today on uh, sharing communicative activities and tasks that can easily be added to the lessons that you have to practice a range of grammar, functions, topics, and issues. So let's begin by defining what we mean by communicative activities. First, there is some kind of interactive exchange going both ways between students. We saw that in the second activity we looked at. In the first activity, though there was pair work, both students were speaking, there was no real interaction or exchange, right? Next, in communicative activities, there's a focus on meaning. In the first activity from before, there was a dialogue and students performed it in pairs, but they were just reading grammatical, uh, grammatically accurate sentences. But in the second activity, the students were paying attention to the message or the meaning that the other one was communicating. They had to in order to write the answers or to answer the questions. Thirdly, there's a purpose for interacting. In the first activity, the purpose is just to read the dialogue and practice the grammar. But in the second activity, the purpose is to get information from your classmates that you don't know. There's also an additional purpose that's not required to make the activity communicative, but it is helpful to learning. And that is that students may also complete a task with the information that they exchange. So in activity two, that task is to find out which classmate is most like you. The fourth component of communicative activities is that there's negotiation of meaning or there's feedback on your communication. Because there is a focus on meaning, in the activity, if one student doesn't understand what the other says, they have to clarify using various strategies, just like in real life. So I imagine that you <clears throat> teachers, like many teachers all around the world, are very busy. You're teaching the required curriculum and you're doing many other things that support your students. And if your textbooks and curricula do not have communicative activities in them, or they don't have very many of them, it's going to take some time to add them to your teaching. So let me share some reasons that research gives us for using communicative activities. 
And you can see that this little extra work can be very worth your time and very worth it to your students learning. Take a moment to read these ways that communicative activities support learning and find one that doesn't fit. Which number is not a way that communicative activities support learning? The number that doesn't fit is memorization. While students will be using the language and that will help them to remember, communicative activities are not designed as a memorization uh, technique. So we see that communicative activities provide number one, real world application uh, skills because the language in the real world is communicative and it's focused on meaning. Number two, it helps with fluency development because students practice speaking in situations where they do not know what is going to happen. And through this kind of practice, they become more skilled at this. And number three, uh, there's interactive learning. It engages more of the student's brain or their cognition. Think about how active the students' brains were in the first activity that we looked at, the reading, the dialogue. Uh, the students could actually do that without, with very little cognition or very little brain development. There was much more cognitive engagement in the second activity as the students listened for answers, asked follow-up questions, and decided who is most like them. And then number four, um, there can be immediate feedback in communicative activities. Students don't have to wait to get their homework back or get their tests scored by the teacher. Um, and the number five will skip because though communicative activities do, does help with students internalizing and remembering language, it's not designed as a memorization technique. <clears throat> number six, Communicative activities do build confidence because students are succeeding in real life conversation, which leads to number seven. Uh, oh, number eight, uh, sorry, leads to number eight, which is increased motivation and engagement. And number seven, critical thinking and creative thinking. These skills are really challenged and the students are involved with um, creative thinking by engaging with different perspectives from other students and developing more complex language skills by expressing themselves, stretching their abilities and, and through problem solving. And all of this leads to number nine which is the development of overall proficiency, which is improved when students use English based on the needs of the situation, which helps them to acquire English, not simply memorize it. So it is worth the effort to include more or to include at all communicative practice activities in your classes. In this webinar, I'll present quite a few activity types and then some specific examples of them for you to consider. I'm going to organize the examples that I share by types of gap activities, which are commonly used for teaching all ages and language levels. They are one of the most common types of communicative activities. If you're looking online for types of communicative activities, you can uh, search for gap activities plus the ages of your students or the language level or the grammar that you want to practice, the vocabulary, the function, the topic, the issue. If you use that with gap activities, you'll get a number of uh, good ideas, I think. So in a gap activity, there is a gap or an empty space between what, sorry, between what students know 
uh, what student A knows or thinks and what student B knows or thinks. The gap can be closed when students communicate and share. They share information, experiences, reasoning, and or opinions. I'm going to share 10 activities with you, 10 information gap activities, uh, and they fall into four categories. And you can be thinking about these four categories and also look at these specific examples for how you might use them in your classes. Uh, the four activities or the four types are describe and draw, describe and identify, surveys, and information sharing in pairs and in groups. Now, when I'm done sharing these information gap activities, you'll have a breakout room to share how you could use at least one of these four types of activities in one of your classes and how, or one of these specific activities that you might share. So, um, at the beginning of this webinar, we told you that we will send you this presentation. These slides will make a PDF and we'll send them to you. Um, so you'll have all of these details so that you can look at them in the future. But right now, you may want to take a few notes as I'm sharing the activities so you can easily think of how you might adapt them. And then you can share that in your group and get even more ideas. The first activity type is called describe and draw. In this activity, students sit back to back or they put some kind of barrier between their papers so they can't see like a book. And one student describes a picture and the other draws it. In the example you see here, uh, both students are younger and the image is a house and a yard. That's just one example of a kind of the kind of image that you can use in a describe and draw information gap activity, but there are many others. This describe and draw activity practices multiple grammar and vocabulary. Uh, it uses ex ex existential sentences using there is, there are. It uses articles, articles practicing when to say a, uh, when to say the prepositions of place, adjectives, and it's also possible to use in describe and draw to practice count and non-count nouns, as well as sets of nouns beyond house and yard. For example, furniture, nature, cities, food, families, animals, weather, you know, any kind of activity or topic that you're using, you can consider ways of applying describe and draw. Another option is that the learner drawing can check their understanding by repeating back the description of what they drew. In the end, the students compare their pictures. Now, there are two ways the, the teacher can give the students a picture and tell them to describe it, or the students can draw their own pictures and describe it to their partner. So you can do either one. You can have more control or less control. Our next activity type is describe and identify. In this type of activity, one student describes something and the other identifies it. Um, there are many, many topics and functions and a lot of varied language that this can practice, use, that we can practice using this type of activity. We're going to look at two types here, and here is one example um, using maps. Um, maps are a very popular way to practice, to use, um, describe, and identify. Both students have a map, but there's a gap in the information that they have on each map. Student A has some places labeled and some blank, and student B has the opposite places labeled and blank. This is a typical information gap setup. So. The students cannot look at the other's map and they have to ask about places they don't know. 
Student A, for example, will ask about the shoe store, the English, lang the English school, the bakery, and the phone store, which student B has on their map. A map can be used for practicing locations or directions using a variety of language. Here's just one example. Student A asks how do you, to get to the English school and student B gives directions. Student A listens and then writes the label language school on the building that they find following the directions. Here's another describe and identify activity. This one is using uh, multiple similar images. The topics for using multiple similar images can vary widely depending on what you're studying. For example, again, like houses, cities, animals, clothes, people doing activities, places in the world, jobs, food, etc. This Image, the images that I'm using are all people's appearance using just their heads. I found these pictures online at a website that has free and some paid activities. So this is a, a website that you could go to and find this activity and others. The website is called Teach This and um, it will be listed in the resources when you get this PDF at the back, um, there's a link. So you can see um, describe and identify activities have various uh, ways that you can use them. And I'm gonna show you two ways using the same pictures. First, I like to create a scenario or a situation along with the task for the information gap activity. That makes it more real life. So for example, in these pictures, I've created two similar situations that have students use different grammar to complete the tasks. The first one is, uh, says that you and a friend are in an evening English class and there are people in, these are the pe pictures of the people that are in class with you. And you know some of the names and your partner knows some. So you should describe to your partner the names that you uh, know and ask your partner their names because you want to have a party and invite everyone in the class. So you want to know everyone's names. That's your purpose. So for example, student A might say, there's a woman, she has short gray hair and white glasses. And student B will answer because they have the picture with, uh, with that person's name, they'll say, oh, that's Haley. That's one example of how you could do this. And here's an, a second situation using the same pictures and a similar situation. Again, you're having a party with your English class, but this time you know some of the names, your partner knows some of the names, that's the same. But this time you have the list of everyone's name. So you can ask, uh, you can take turns asking and uh, answering questions about one feature for each person that you don't know to find out what their name is. This could look like student A saying, does Lucy have red hair? And student B says, no, she's blonde. So now student A knows where Lucy is. By the way, uh, the activity that I found online uh, has many, many more faces than just this, these 16. Um, but I'm showing you just these because I wanted you to be able to see them clearly. If we put them all on the page, it's too small. So I've just included a few. And remember that this is a describe and identify type of activity using multiple similar images. They don't have to be people's faces. Can you think of other language or topics or images or situations that you could use, describe and identify for in your class? You can take a note now. Could you use this anyway in the language that you're uh, studying in your classes? Okay, here is another popular information gap activity. 
and that it's very easy to make using a wide variety of grammar and vocabulary. And this activity is information sharing with tick boxes. In this activity, students um, share information from two tables where they each have different information. Your textbook may have grammar that you can very easily adapt into a table like this. Um, and for this information gap with tick boxes, the language that the students are practicing is asking and describing people's abilities using the modal can. So student A might ask student B about Mateo because student A doesn't know about Mateo's uh, abilities. Student A could ask, can Mateo sing? And student B answers, no, there's an X, so Mateo cannot sing. Then student B answer, uh, student A marks an X uh, in the box. Or student A can describe people that they know, making statements. Uh, student A has information about Mariam, so they can say, Mariam can't sing, cook, or bake, but she can draw. And then student B puts X's and O's in the correct squares for Mariam. So some of you may have information gap activities like this already in your textbooks. Also, if so, the next step is for you to create a situation or a task for students to complete with the information like I did for the previous activity. Creating a situation um, and tasks makes this information gap um, more real life and involves more variety in the type of language students use. It engages their critical thinking more and this has a really positive effect on their fluency and proficiency, as well as confidence and motivation. Now, I don't always come up with amazing situations or tasks for all the information gap activities that I use, but I try to create something. I, I do this by asking myself, when do we naturally use this kind of information in conversation? When do we have this kind of natural information gap? So the task for this activity is to assign the best person based on their abilities for each role needed at a fundraising food sale next week. So we have, a, we have to know what people's abilities are so we can assign them a task. So that gives us a reason to ask about their abilities and then we solve the problem by using that information. The roles that uh, we will assign are entertainment, food preparation, and decorating. And those align with sing, cook, bake, and draw. Um, so after completing the tick boxes, the students decide who should have each role. And then they can share that information in class and see if people came up with the same answers. Um, so if you have a note about how you might uh, use tick box activity information gap sharing or add a situation or a task to an information gap activity. Please take a little note now so that you have some ideas to share and to apply to your class. Our next type of information gap activity is information sharing, making timelines. In this type of activity, students have different information about when things happened in a person's life or in the development of an important event or issue. This one can easily be adapted to higher level learners or even learners with specific purposes for studying English. This is an example of a famous person timeline. In this example, the students share information uh, that they have about important events in a person's life, and the students uh, complete the timelines and then compare. The activity that I'll share uses the young climate activist, Greta Thunberg. Here's an example of what the timeline template could look like. And here are some examples of information that student A and student B might have to share about Greta's life. For example, when she was born, 
when she first learned about climate change, and they aren't exactly in order. So the students share and they have to create the timeline based on their information plus the, the other person's information. Now let's look at a type of group information gap activity. This type of activity is surveys. Surveys can use WH questions, like the one on the left asking, how often do you? And for these, students write one question and survey or ask a minimum number of students. Uh, for example, they ask this question, the same question to six students, and they write their names down in the table and their answers. And then they could present. They could present their answers in a small group, a summary of what the most uh, of the answers, or they could share the most popular answer, or they could write a paragraph summarizing the answers that they got. Another survey style uses yes, no questions. For this, the students may write more than one question if you want. And then they interview a minimum number of students. And this time the interviewer writes the names in the column and then uh, whether the name, the person answers yes or whether they answer no, they write their names in those columns. And then again, they can present what they found in a small group. Um, they could write a few sentences to describe what they found. The examples here use simple language but they could be adapted, these uh, surveys could be adapted to include questions with more complex language and ideas. So think now about what kind of survey questions your students could ask to practice useful language for them, or you might think back to the timeline. Is there a famous person or an event that you might be able to use a timeline for in your class? And you might want to take a note about that now. I'm going to do one more uh, survey group uh, activity, and this is a mingle. Um, it's a very popular activity, so I wanted to be sure to share it. And it's called Find Someone Who. And this Find Someone Who, uh, in this activity, students get a paper with questions or question prompts. Um, in uh, boxes, and the questions are ones that students in class are, are likely, at least some students are likely to say yes to. So they um, take turns asking and answering any one question and write the person's name in the box if they say yes. So then students must ask follow-up questions. Do you see a common denominator here? We're always trying to, I'm always trying to add follow-up questions to increase the amount of communicative practice students get. Um, it strengthens the real life communication and increases student talking time. So here's a short version of a find someone who activity. And this find someone who is practicing the present perfect but you can use other grammar points or use a variety of grammar points. You don't need to have just one. Let's, um, let's see how the activity looks in the classroom. So student A selects one box on the paper and asks, for example, have you ever driven a car? And student B says, no. Student A still asks a follow-up question. Again, this is something I added and I don't find in most information gap activities. So I challenge you to add it and see how your students respond. Um, especially if you already use information gap activities, this is perhaps your next step to strengthen um, your uh, use of communicative activities. Next, student A finds a new partner and they don't write student B's name in the square because student B said no. The new partner says yes, and student A asks a follow-up question, and then they write the name of that student in the square. After a specified time, tell the group to stop, and then you can have students share some interesting information that they learned about people in the class. Um, can you now think of a 
class, you could use find someone who in you could use it as a warm up or you could use it as uh, to practice specific activity or grammar or uh, topics. Would you use it um, with all the same grammar or would you mix up the grammar? All right, we're all we have a couple more information gap activities and here are two more examples. Um, one is to find the differences and one is to find your matches in the uh, find your, the differences on the left. Uh, a pair of students or a small group read two or more versions of the same story or text with a few differences in each version. You could use a text that's in your textbook and you could just write two an, an, another one or maybe two versions of the same text, but you make some changes. I add some information or make a few changes. And then the students get together and they uh, they each read one version and then they uh, tell the story or retell the text and find the differences. This can work very well with more advanced classes and texts or with simpler texts and younger students. And can you think of a text that you could use this for with your students um, to create one or two more versions of the same text to use this activity? The other activity is find your image matches. For this, the teacher prepares cards with images on them, enough so each student can have two or three matches. And they can be pictures of people's outfits, families, cities, people, food, dishes, houses, nature scenes, weather, et cetera. And each student gets two or three cards and they mingle and talk to other students, taking turns to describe or ask questions to find out who has their matching cards. Note that if you spend the time to make these cards, make sure you get them back so you can use them again. You could use them for many different um, activities. So are there topics or cards that you could use in a few classes and use this find your matches activity? The last activity um, for group information uh, sharing is the jigsaw activity. And it is very popular and very useful for all English language levels. It's called the jigsaw activity because it's like a puzzle. If you've heard about this and never tried it, I hope you will very soon and you'll understand after this. Uh, jigsaw activities are used with a reading or a listening text or with a video. And they're most appropriate, um, they're appropriate for all uh, ages and levels, or at least most ages. Step one is preparation. The teacher divides a topic, a reading, a video, or an audio into sections for groups to teach each other, usually between three and five sections. For this example, we'll use four sections. It's also helpful if the teacher makes a set of guiding questions that are the same or similar for each section. So for example, a graphic organizer, like a chart or a mind map that as students read or listen to their section, they fill out the information. Next, students get into groups that have the same number of sections. In our example, this would be groups of four. And there are call, uh, these are called their teaching groups. Uh, here we're using numbers one, two, three, and four, so that the next step is that the learners move to what we call their expert groups. So all the ones get together, all the twos get together, all the threes get together, and they learn about their section of the reading or the listening or the video. So they just focus on that one section and they work individually at first, and then they work as a group to be sure everyone knows the information well. So they help each other. Step four, the students return to their original teaching groups. So in this case, with numbers one, two, three, and four, they take turns sharing their information and writing down the information that others share using a, that graphic organizer or the guiding questions. And then step five is assessment 
of each person on all the information. In this way, they're motivated to make sure that they understand everything that everyone else um, said. So in communicative activities, you wanna have a reason for speaking and you wanna have a reason for listening. So you're looking for ways to increase that. And um, <laughs> this is an external motivation to have an assessment on all the information. This activity can work on all language skills. It, it, um, it improves critical thinking, social skills, and confidence. And can you think of a text in your classroom um, where you could use a jigsaw activity that would be useful to your class? Give me a second to think. All right, we're ready for our breakout, our first breakout group um, task. So we've been looking at types of activities for information gaps. Before we look at opinion and reasoning gaps, we're going to give you a chance to share some ideas about how you can adapt and use the, the information gap activities in your classes. So we're gonna give you 10 minutes. And when you get to your breakout room, please assign someone to watch the time. And after six minutes, you should be moved to question two if you haven't done that already. Please work in your uh, breakout room for equal participation. So that means that if you uh, find yourself talking a lot, uh, please start asking others some questions. The questions uh that you'll ask in the breakout or discuss in the breakout room are number one how can we adapt one or more of these information gap activities to your classroom what are things that you can take from all these activities what could you use in your class and number two is what other ideas do you have about information gaps in our classes i'm sure that you have varying experience and you probably have lots of good ideas to share. At the bottom of the slide here, I've listed the types of information gap activities we looked at. So describe and draw, um, describe and identify, that is the map and the pictures of people's heads, and then surveys and find someone who, and information sharing using tick boxes, timelines, find differences in reading, find your matches, and jigsaw. Enjoy your conversation with your colleagues, and we'll see you in about 10 minutes. You should be seeing the invitation in just a moment. But welcome back. I hope you had some interesting sharing in your breakout rooms and have some new ideas uh, about how to use uh, communicative information gaps in your classes. Now let's move to looking at opinion and reason gap activities. Here you can see types of opinion and reason gap activities. Um, there are opinion polls and surveys, debates, opinion essays and presentations, opinion discussion game boards, and reason gaps, uh, solving uh, reason gap activities that are solving problems and completing tasks. Some of these are more common and straightforward, and I won't be sharing specific examples of all of them because um, they don't need as much explanation. First is debates. Um, using pairs or groups in debates, students take a stance, which is an opinion presented as fact and then supported with reasons and evidence. And debates um, have long been part of the English language classroom. They can be very simple and informal, or they can be much more formal um, with strict rules and uh, procedures and have carefully structured arguments. Um, they can be incredible learning experiences for students. Uh, next, there are opinion essays and presentations that you um, that you can and may already be giving to help students craft their self-expression. Um, in the next few minutes, I'm going to share examples of opinion discussions 
and that may be new to you, I'll share some examples of opinion polls and surveys, and then give several examples of different types of reason gap activities. After this section, like I've said, you'll have another opportunity to share your ideas in the breakout room, or if you can't get to one, you can share them here in the main room. So again, I'll remind you that we will send a PDF of this present these presentation slides next week, but I'll encourage you to take notes um, on ways that you might use any of these opinion or reason gap activities in your classes or other ideas they spark for opinion and reason gap activities. I'm not gonna say more about debates or opinion essays or presentations, but if you have some ideas about how you could use them or you um, in your classes, you could take a note of that and share that later too. Oops. Uh, the first activity type I'd like to discuss is opinion discussions. Opinion discussions can begin even with younger students and even when students have lower levels. They don't have to have high level English to share an opinion. Um, you can just ask a, to them to share short opinions. Opinion uh, discussions are really rich language learning opportunities and they're especially, especially helpful for students at the intermediate levels um, to discuss what they've read or heard and to express themselves on a range of topics so that they have sufficient practice to use all of the language that they've studied in order to develop more advanced proficiency. You know, they've studied lots of language and they need opportunities to, to draw on all of it, to move forward, to develop more advanced proficiency. Opinion discussion is a very easy is very easy to include in your classes um, in response to reading, listening, or an issue, or even images. An opinion discussion can be a short activity that you use often, or you can teach skills for sharing opinions, communication strategies, for example, and spend more time on them uh, if that fits your context. I really encourage all of you to regularly give students a chance to discuss their opinions, um, especially in response to what they have read or listened to. In many classes and in many textbooks, I see um, there's a reading or listening and students read or listen, and then immediately they go to language work, grammar or vocabulary work about that reading or listening or video. Um, and of, of course that's useful for students in, in some ways, um, you know, they need to learn some language. However, it's very easy to include more discussion practice by asking them to share their opinion after they read before they do that language work. Um, you can also include short or longer, if you have time, opinion discussion in responses to images. This might be new for some of you and I'm excited to share it. Um, there are many photos included as part of the insert pictures function in MS Word and in um, Google documents and slides. Here are eight beautiful pictures of the United States that I got um, from the American English website. This is sponsored by the US Embassy uh, or the Department of State and the link to this resource and many, many free resources on the American English website is included at the end of this slide. Um, and I really encourage you to go there and find some. Um, that link will be at the end of the PowerPoint presentation when we send it out to you in PDF by email next week. Uh, if you have a collection of photos like this, you can ask an opinion question and it could even fit the grammar or topic that you're covering in your school curriculum or textbook. Here's an example. 
Um, if you could step into one photo, which would it be? What would you do? This question, as an example, creates a natural use of the conditional, and it allows intermediate language learners to practice the conditional while needing to activate rich knowledge of the language that they've already studied and that they need to fully they need to practice in order to fully integrate. Here's another example of a question that you could use. Um, choose one place and imagine you live there. Describe your daily life. Um, and there are many, many more grammar and vocabulary focuses as well as topics that you could use. Uh, for example, here's one more. Uh, select one picture and imagine you live there. This is for more advanced level uh, learners. How does your life contribute to climate change in that place? So you could look at all these different uh, aspects of American life and select one and how does your life impact climate change? And then you could even talk about how can you improve um, your impact on climate change um, coming from these pictures and then move that to their own lives. So there's a lot you can do as a springboard with these pictures. Think of some of the classes that you're teaching now. Is there a place in your lesson that you could use an opinion discussion question that you haven't been using it? Are you asking students to discuss their opinions after reading a text or listening? Could you ask opinion questions that fit your classes using these photos or photos like these? Make a note of any ideas that you might have. You can share them in the breakout room or keep them and apply them to your classes. So the next two activities that I'll share with you are fun while also providing students with the benefits of discussion and a chance to speak spontaneously um, for extended periods. This is a um, very important part of language development. As students become more advanced, they're able to, or they're expected to be able to speak for longer and longer stretches of time. This activity provides an opportunity to do that spontaneously. Um, the two activities I'll share uh, both use discussion questions and a game board, which students can find uh, very engaging. The first example um, uses questions on cards and a separate game board. You can see the game board on the left, on the side, um, it has squares with points, you know, 250, 350 um, on the squares and instructions like miss a turn or go ahead two spaces. Now students can go around the game board many times and we'll send you um, this game board um, in the email next week, uh, you'll have a link to a copy of that. So here are the steps for using this discussion game board. One, questions are printed on individual cards and put into a stack. So here are some examples of questions. Should high school begin at 9.30 a.m.? And should plastic bags be outlawed in the town or city? Uh, two, Players roll a dice, they can use real dice or they can use a phone and they move uh, to squares on the board. Next, they choose one of the question cards and they answer it. Now you can make some requirements here. For example, that the students have to give two reasons for their opinion or that they have to talk for a specified amount of time. For example, they have to talk for 30 seconds to get the points, or they have to talk for one full minute, you decide. Um, these choices would depend on your context. Number four, one or more people ask follow-up questions. Um, this ensures that players are listening to the person speaking. 
you know, often in classes, one person is speaking, they're engaged, but the people in their group, they're not really listening. But if they have to ask a follow-up question, they're more likely to listen actively. Or, and follow-up questions, like we've said before, involve a range of language and um, engage the students cognitively, helping them to reap all the benefits that we looked at previously. And the last one is uh, the player gets the points on the square. Yay! This can be very motivating. Again, it's an external, uh, motiv an, an extrinsic motivation while using um, a very uh, important, uh, building very important skills that the students have or need. The next type is discussion questions that are written on the game board and also using follow-up questions. Uh, this option is also can be focused on a topic, vocabulary, or grammar, just like the other one, and it too supports longer stretches of speech. Um, this option uh, has all the questions written on the game board. And for this one, I suggest not using dice um, that have the option of moving six spaces because you can quickly get to the end and pass many of these wonderful questions. Um, so I'd suggest for this kind of activity to use something with just a smaller number of options for spaces like a coin. The students can flip a coin on if they get one side, they move one space or two spaces. And if they get the other side, they move three spaces, maybe four spaces, you can decide. Um, but that will help to uh, make sure that they talk about a lot of the discussion questions. Each game board style has some advantages and disadvantages, but mostly they're logistical. For example, do you as the teacher want to print and cut out sets of cards for students? Um, if you do it one time, you'll be able to use them again. So it's often use the, uh, worth the effort. Um, it's easier to print questions on a game board and give each group one picture uh, or paper, but you can ensure that students answer more questions if they have the cards. Also, my experience has shown that they really like getting those points of the points game. Otherwise, the game is very similar in both option number one and two. And the winner is the person here in option um, two that gets to the end first. Uh, you can decide which option works best for you. Can you think of an opinion discussion questions that you could put on a game board and use with your students? Take a note now and um, you can share that in the chat or in the breakout room. Uh, we also can use opinion gap activities uh, with surveys. We looked at students doing information gap surveys and you can also have them do opinion gap surveys which practice specific language and or they can be focused on one topic or issue. So for the opinion gap activities, each student writes their own opinion questions and then they survey a minimum number of classmates and ask follow-up questions, uh, of course, and then they present or share their findings orally or in writing. So it's very similar to the info information gap but there's a little more control here and a little bit longer speech um, for the students doing in opinion gap activities. And now we're at our last topic of uh, gap activities, and that is the reasoning gap activities. And these can focus on language, they can focus on topics or issues, and they can be used in a project. Um, but the reason gap activities will naturally use many, many language forms and a range of, of vocabulary, even if they are designed to practice one specific type of grammar, they will use many types. Um, they give the students a very rich opportunity for expressing themselves using all the language they know. 
um, and to build on their creativity and critical thinking. In reason gap activities, uh, the students work together to complete a task, for example, to figure something out or to produce or create something. And here's an example. In this one, the groups plan an itinerary uh, for a fictional foreign exchange student visiting their town or city for a weekend. So they decide which activities they'll do with the foreign exchange student, what transportation they'll use, where they'll have meals, what they'll eat, et cetera. And in this example, they create or produce a detailed plan for the weekend. Um, this plan idea can be adapted to various scenarios depending on your context. It doesn't have to be a foreign exchange student. Um, it could be a conference that they plan or a special event. It depends on their interests, their needs linguistically, their um, interests in their language level. Another example of a reason gap activity is one where a group figures something out. So in this one, groups uh, read about a fictional crime that took place and each role play detectives who have some information about the suspects around the time of the crime. They share the information and use it to solve the crime. Lastly, I'd like to share four different types of reason activities and give you one example for each. Now, there are many examples for each. So while I'm giving the examples, I, I love for you to be thinking about how could you adapt it to your classes. The first one is listing. And listing requires prioritizing and analyzing, which are getting higher on the levels of cognitive thinking. An example is, as a group, list 10 things you would pack on a wilderness weekend in the rainforest. So you all, you have to agree on the 10 things. Next is sorting or ordering. And this is similar, but it's a little different um, because uh, this one, you have to put in order the five most important characteristics of an ideal city or town that you might live in. And you've got to agree. We have comparing and contrasting. Um, the example here is to compare and contrast three actions that reduce climate change. So you look at three different ways that people can reduce climate change and you compare them, how they're similar, how they're different, and probably in the end, you could rank them. Finally, we have creating tasks. And this example, the task is for students to prepare plans for redecorating part of the school inside or outside. So they're again, creating a plan and Again, there are many um, other ways that they could create something or that they could uh, create a different kind of plan that's similar. Do you have ideas that are similar to this? Take a moment, look at these, think of one type that you could use in your class this week even. Uh, it doesn't have to be an example, but um, could you use something similar to the foreign exchange student, plan or the solving crime activity or any of these. Well, now we're ready to go to breakout uh, group two and you'll have the task to discuss opinion and reason gaps. Again, we'll give you 10 minutes um, and you'll work again toward equal participation in your group. The first question is uh, to describe how you could adapt one to three activities um, from the examples of opinion discussion, uh, opinion uh, and reasoning gaps. And if you have time, um, discuss what other ideas you have about opinion and reasoning gap activities. Here is the list of the opinion and reason activity types that we looked at. So opinion surveys and presentations, debates, 
discussions responding to reading, listening, and video. Also, discussions responding to images. Discussions on game boards. One, having the questions on the board. One, not uh, having the questions on cards. And reasoning tasks, such as making a plan, solving problems, ordering, ranking, comparing, and creating. Hi, Lois. I'm so sorry to cut you off here. I just wanted to flag that it is 930. Uh, so I, I understand that some people may need to leave. No. Yes. Yeah, so maybe if, uh, if you would like, we can actually get started on the Q&A section. Yeah. Anyone who needs to leave now can leave their comments in the chat. As we mentioned at the beginning, Lois will be addressing some of the questions that she, uh, that she's not able to answer right now in that follow up email. Uh, right. Lois, if, yeah, apologies. I was just to say, if you want to, if you need to leave, go ahead and put a question in the chat and I'll try to um, answer some of these and send them out next week. Yes. And Gina just reposted the link to the Google form to get your badges, your digital badge. It's in the chat now. So please feel free to click on that, fill out the short form with your contact information within the next week until November 28th, so you can get your badge. Uh, so Lois, please let us know if you would like to do Q&A now and maybe a breakout group for anyone who has time to stay or uh, whatever you would prefer. I would love to do Q&A now if anyone wants to. Um, and um, people can also um, invite people to share um, any ideas that they want to share in the chat for everyone. And um, you can type your questions into the chat now. If you'd like me to answer anything, you're also free to go. It's really great to have so many people join this um, important um, conversation and our webinar topic. Thank you so much for um, coming. I'll wait here for a Q&A or for people's, uh, to people to share ideas. So the chat is officially open for Q&A. Please uh, address any questions to Lois now. We did see a few good questions pop up earlier during the webinar, so we'd love to see those come up again. Yeah, I did see one, and maybe I can just kick us off while mm -hmm. people are thinking and typing. Um, one was how do you how do you manage these activities for large classrooms 35 or more students yeah first of all i think that's a really good co uh, question it's a concern of a lot of people and i know teachers who have had 100 students i personally have done um, information gap activities um, and uh, opinion gap activities with students in classes of 65. That's been my largest class. Um, with, with that one thing that you can do, if you don't, so that you need to give really good instructions. That's one thing I would say, um, go step by step and make sure that you model the activity before you ask the students to do it. So have two students come up or you act like one person and um, the other person uh, come up and you do the activity so they can see it. Have instructions on the board or on a PowerPoint if you have a presentation um, so that they, they really understand what they're supposed to do. That's really important because you can't go and help everyone at once. The other thing is if you have um, that you, you may want to choose uh, activities that don't have lots and lots of materials. I choose activities that have a lot of materials, even with large classes, and it can be done. Um, but uh, one thing that you could do is if you have students sit back to back, um, if you have a PowerPoint or a presentation on one side of the room, they could be looking at that with that could have like their map or their information that they're sharing. And the other student is looking at the, all the other students are looking at the back. So you don't have to pass out pieces of paper. You have, you could have a poster in the back that has that information. Now that'll take a little time to create, but it will save a lot of time in um, needing to uh, pass out all the papers, for example. But those are two ways um, to do it. I. 
um, and that's that's like a information gap where students are sharing where they can't see. Mingling, I, an activity that requires mingling. I don't think you should shy away from that, even if you have a large class. You could tell students to talk to the people that are near them if you don't want them running all over class. Um, if you have a very large class and you're worried about noise, you could tell them to speak softly, and that can be fun. Um, that's one challenge that often comes up. And um, but opinion activities are and reasoning activities are really good. They can work with just the people right by them. I've worked in classes where um, large groups where the students are all in chairs that are they can't be moved. They can't move around easily. There's not a lot of space, but they can talk to one partner here, the person in front of them, the person behind them. So there are options that you can use for that. I, um, I think you should do it. <laughs> um, is there another question? Yes, so we do have a few more questions, including um, a couple of people who would like to unmute themselves to ask you their questions. Is that something? Of course. Great. Uh, Nassim, I'll be unmuting you at the, right now. I've sent a request. Okay. Um, while we, oh, here we go. Thank you so nice of you giving me a chance to, talk, to ask a question. Uh, okay. Can you, uh, I mean, you can say, I am from Pakistan. There are a large num number of students in our classes, as someone else has mentioned. And uh, we are not, you can say, well equipped with uh, digital tools as well. So sometimes I use uh, Kahoot to get some different opinions, to share some, uh, you can say, videos of, for my students. It's very interesting, uh, you think, to get different opinions from our students. The students mm -hmm. like gamification in this way, but sometimes uh, due to you can say that um, not because proper connectivity of the systems we cannot do well in our classes. May you suggest something that we can do another thing for our students? Um, yes, I I have also had the same problem with Kahoot, and so. Um, if I'm working overseas, I don't use Kahoot anymore just because <laughs> I don't want it to fail. Um, with so, are, are you asking specifically about um, Kahoot? Is asking the students, you know, it's like a multiple choice poll kind of thing, right? Um, so that is communicative. That it's from teacher to student. So the activities that I gave you were more student to student, and they're they're low lower tech. Um, At the very basic, yeah, you can say very initial stages for the students they can work well. I what think kind that of activities? some of the activities that I shared um, really do work well for um, higher level students, especially the opinion and reasoning gaps, the jigsaw activity. You can change the grammar that um, is being practiced. Um, and if you add the follow up questions, for example, that provides more uh, rich uh, language is required. And but if you have very high level students, um, you might want to do more of the opinion and reasoning gap activities and jigsaw activities are really commonly used um, not just in language learning but you know when i taught in a graduate school we used um, jigsaw readings as a way to engage the students and make them responsible for their own learning and they were all you know advanced level speakers of english yes I have learned a great way to engage my students through, through you can say gap activities as well for the grammar activities. Mm -hmm. I'll use in my class too, inshallah. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Okay, Lois, uh, so we've got a few more questions here. Uh, first, I'd like to quickly address, we have a few people asking if there are any websites where they can download useful worksheets and learning materials. Um, I understand that the PDF of the presentation slides will have uh, links to resources. Lois, is that right? 
Yeah, the um, the final page of the slides, um, the PDF of the slide will have the links to the resources that I used in this presentation, plus a few more other links. Um, one, I shared a couple. One, I said the Think First has some, but also if you uh, do a search in your um, browser, like Google, for example, um, and you write information or gap activities or communicative activities plus, and then you put the other thing that you want communicative activities for. You could use grammar, vocabulary, a topic, an issue, um, advanced students, intermediate students. So you can do searches like that. I really encourage you. You'll find so many wonderful uh, ideas out there, but I will share a few in the uh, PowerPoint slides, but you don't have to wait. <laughs> Great. And just as a reminder to anyone, uh, I know we're over time. Please remember that the recording of this webinar will be available for everyone in an email we'll send in about a week. So you'll, you'll be able to hear Lois's responses to these questions. Uh, she'll also respond to some via text in that email. Okay, so Lois, we have two separate questions uh, that are kind of on different ends of the spectrum here. We have someone asking how these activities can be applied for complete beginners and another person asking how they can be applied to make reading, teaching reading more attractive with GAC activities at the university level for large classes. Okay. Um, for at the beginning, um, at beginner levels, uh, I think that uh, it's actually not that difficult to make, uh, it, I would, you can use information gap activities please look back at the examples that I gave, describe and uh, draw is not, a, not totally beginner, but it can be uh, a beginner type activity. You can give them, for example, uh, shapes, uh, colored shapes, pink circle, uh, green square, and I, just, and I put the shapes on my uh, paper, I um, arrange them in one way and then I describe, you know, there's the green shape is on the right of the pink shape or the, the pink circle, the green square is on the right of the pink circle and I describe just shapes and colors and then we can check and see. You could have um, students do a checkbox survey where they say, the, the one that I gave you was very simple, you know, can Mateo sing? Can Mateo uh, cook? Can Mateo bake? That's pretty easy English. Um, you can also do likes and dislikes. Um, you can do nationalities with that checkbox. Um, uh, the checkbox uh, information sharing activity, you know, is this person Australian? Are they Indonesian? Are they Algerian, for example? And you can find out um, different activities, let's see. So I, I think if you look back through the types of activities and just think of very simple grammar, a lot of the, um, the grammar that I provided in the examples was pretty easy, you know, describing someone, does, does she have red hair? Um, yes or no. In the in find someone who you can write the whole question and you know do you like pizza, do you like summer? Those are very easy questions that you can use. Oh, and then the other one was university. What was the question? Um, how do you make reading more engaging? I really would encourage you to do two things that I mentioned today. One is the um, the jigsaw reading um, that gives a purpose for the reading. The students are, uh, you know, when they have a clear activity that they have purpose for reading, then they are, you know, reading with a purpose and that, that helps them use strategies that are appropriate and can be more engaging. And then when they know they're responsible to share with their peers and it creates a group feeling in the classroom, even though it's a reading class, that can be helpful. Also um, give them at least a moment, a, a short activity where they share their opinions about the reading and not just use it for grammar or um, other things. You can use 
more opinion uh, type activities like debates, um, opinion presentations. You could use the discussion game board. They love that. Students love that. And you know, you might think, oh, they're university students. They're too serious. Adult students love that as well. Um, and the timeline activity is a really um, useful activity for older students who are, you know, more advanced levels who are looking at issues. You can put the timeline, doesn't have to be about a person. It can be about an event. It could be about a process. So you can think of what things are chronological if that fits what um, you're studying. Great. Uh, so I do want to quickly flag, we have someone asking for a group photo. I think we can get to that um, after we answer just one or two more questions, if that's okay. How about two more and then we'll let people go and okay. we'll take a group photo before we do that. That'd be great. Okay, that sounds great. So um, the next question is about, sorry, one moment, timing. Uh, we have a few participants here who are asking how to implement these tasks when you have to stick to a very strict curriculum and there's a certain yeah. timeline you have to finish on time and there are a lot of um, a lot of students in your classes we have some participants yeah. mentioning that it's stressful and it doesn't really work well for for English language learning um, I would say that it works very well for English language learning, but it is can be challenging to work with your curriculum, <laughs> but it benefits your students so much um, because of all those reasons that I gave at the beginning. Um, I know that it's a challenge to do uh, to do tasks and activities, and you may want to uh, stick to things that uh, work most closely with what you're studying in your uh, in your curriculum so that you're I would suggest that you find small things that you can add that don't take a lot of time. For example, if you're using reading, just give them three minutes or five minutes, four minutes to share their opinion about the reading. That doesn't take very long and it doesn't take any preparation or much preparation on your part. Um, if they're reading something and you give them a jigsaw activity, that really helps their reading skills. And, you know, they, if, if you, the more you use um, communicative activities and gap activities like this, they will develop, you know, critical thinking and fluency. And I know that. Um, they have to pass a test. So that's why I gave a lot of examples that are focused on specific grammar, because you can um, you could spend five minutes at the beginning of your class or at the end of the class as a reward um, to do an interactive or a communicative activity that's focused specifically on some grammar that that you've studied um, that day or previously. Uh, you know, like the find someone who activity, you can just have them recycle grammar for that. It, it's it's like a grammar drill. It just is more fun. <laughs> um, the same, um, the discussion board, you know, the, the board, the points board that they can go around and you put the questions on the cards. You could put grammatical questions on those too. Um, that's not really information gap, however, so. That's a different topic, <laughs> but um, I encourage you to find, you know, you could do those little checkbox, the tick box activities or um, something that's, I think you might want to stick to very grammatically focused or reading, listening focused activities. But I do encourage you to try to find a little bit of time to fit um, some of these in, you know, maybe identify one thing that you're going to try and do that for a while and then decide one more thing. You know, don't try to do everything with all your classes all at once. Just make one small little um, change that's not too hard for you and doesn't maybe take too much time, but um, then begin to build on that over time. But I do encourage you to really try to get some of this in there. Thank You're you, Lois, yeah. No, you're, it can be frustrating to work with these large class sizes and uh, these uh, quick timelines, but 
Yeah, it can be done. I know lots of teachers who who do manage to do it. I myself have managed to do it. And once you you know start, don't start with everything. And you know, links changes slowly, and it'll become more and more comfortable. Perfect. You'll see results. Great. So our last question before the group photo is just about working with uh, students' anxiety over over engaging um, in it, large classes or even smaller group settings. Yeah, um, one thing uh, with that is I think these are practice activities, so they're not assessment activities. They're a chance for students to practice the language to help them do better on the assessments. That's one way you can frame it. Um, and if you do things that are fun, then they get to know each other. You can begin when students are, you know, lower levels, if you have them at that time, sharing simple opinions, um, you know, low, low stress things where they share just something small. Um, the find someone who activity has a lot of support and it can create a group feeling and break down people's anxiety. They're holding a paper, you know, they have to write the answer that can help people feel supported, but it also creates friendships in the class because they learn um, about each other. If the students have a lot of anxiety, you can write the question out completely for them. They just have to read it. And then um, the answers, the students that answer, they can use whatever language they have. It doesn't have to be accurate. You know, they just have to get it out and slowly, if they do it over time, they'll gain confidence and their, their accuracy will improve as their fluency also improves. Um, but that's um, one thing these, when they have these um, tick box uh, information gap tables too, you know, there's a lot of support there. You read, does Ken Mateo sing? Yes, he can. You know, that's that's very supportive before they get to the part about assigning who would um, do what task. And maybe the, your students at the beginning, when you're first doing it, maybe they don't have, they're too anxious to do the task about who would be the best person to cook. But you might ask the whole class, who would be the best person to entertain at uh, our fundraiser? So you could ask the whole class, you know, something like that. So. I think it's your your right to be thinking about student um, anxiety, and a lot of these activities do have more support than others um, do. So choose some that have more writing um, that they can do uh, or that they can look at uh, and answer more simply before you move on to other things. And again, um, you might want to start by asking some of these task questions at the end to the whole group rather than um, making them do it together. Although, or you could have them, sorry, you could have them think about the answer before they share it. That really reduces um, anxiety. So for example, they do the info, information gap sharing about with the tick boxes, like for example, Cam Mateo Singh, and then you ask them, to decide which person do they think would be best for each role by themselves, silently. And then they share their opinions because, uh, and they complete the task because that gives them uh, time to think and can reduce anxiety. Those are a couple things that I would suggest. But they will, they will get better. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Lois. So we have a couple more questions about teaching grammar that Lois can answer in the email, the follow-up email that we'll send out in about a week. Uh, for people asking about certificates for attending, as a reminder, there is a digital badge that we are offering for this webinar. Gina has resent the Google form in the WebEx chat. You can fill out this form with your contact information so that you get the digital badge. There'll be more information about the digital badges sent out in that email, that follow-up email I mentioned. So as a closer, I just want to say thank you all to for joining this webinar and thank you for bearing with us uh, as we dealt with some of the technical difficulties for our first webinar. 
I hope you enjoyed it. This is the first in our series, ELT Classroom Connections. As I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar and all throughout, uh, within about a week, we will be sending an email with a PDF of the presentation slides, and that PDF will include links to resources used in the presentation. Uh, the email will also include more information about the digital badges and how you can use them, answers to some of the questions in the WebEx chat that were not addressed during this Q&A session, and a link to our YouTube page, where the World Learning TESOL YouTube page, where you will find an edited recording of this webinar that you can uh, come to again and again to review all of Lois's fantastic insights. Uh, so the badge survey link has been posted to the chat a couple of times by Gina. He, please feel free to fill that out anytime until November 28th. Uh, we'll have a second webinar in about three months, so please keep an eye out for any emails on that. And I think that's everything. Thank you again to Lois for, for your insights, and thank you to everyone else for joining. Have a great day. Thank you, everyone. We'll see Bye -bye. you at the next webinar. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.